first wanted to actually thank for this conference because even though I've been researching a lot on misinformation, I think it's extremely rare to see whole conferences dedicated to misinformation in academia. And my own research actually uh, was targeting how deep fakes are uh, threatening democracies and the rule of law. So it means deep fake propaganda or courtroom evidence. But I tried to extend on my research, and today uh, we will talk about how actually deep fakes will undermine uh, academic research. Uh, just before starting, I wonder how many of you know what deep fakes are and have actually encountered. At least you know that you have encountered. If you could just raise your hand. Okay, so that's quite a lot of people. So, uh, but anyway, I would like to give like a brief uh, introduction to what deepfakes are. So deepfakes are very uh, realistic AI-generated images or audio or video um, that, um, uh, that are extremely convincing. So the ways that deepfakes uh, can manifest, it can be a deepfake on an individual. Uh, I can use your image to create a deepfake video. I can use your voice to create a deepfake audio. In fact, one of the cases of courtroom evidence was in a family, it was a custody case where a mother uh, made a deepfake audio on her husband to gain full custody over the child, and it was in the UK a few years ago. Uh, and it can also be events. So you can deepfake a whole situation, you can deepfake satellite images, and you can deepfake medical data, which includes, for example, MRI images. Um, so, interesting, I don't want to go too much into the history, but I thought this was very interesting to see. I just now realized that the first deepfake was in 2017, at least the one that we know, and it has been six years. And I have to say from a lawyer's perspective, it's actually a bit scary that it has been six years and we knew already what the threats are going to be, but there is no actual regulation. Uh, and it's only the last year, and that is to be fair, thanks to this more like an umbrella term, generative AI at ChatGPT, that they started to talk about deepfakes as well. Uh, but um, and nothing, um, I mean, compared to the threats that it poses, uh, definitely not enough is being done. Uh, the first deepfake was a deepfake pornographic image, and um, a few years ago, a report was saying that over 90% of the deepfakes that we have online was actually pornographic. Over 90% of those deepfakes were targeting women and children. Mm -hmm. uh, but the same report also said that uh, within a few years we will see a shift, and it will not be any more pornographic, it will become a lot as part of disinformation, misinformation, but also the field of creativity. So we can see, for example, in Hollywood, the strikes that are happening. So that is also um, due to deepfakes. Uh, now, this is just an example, um, two pretty scary cases. That one is one of the first cases of such uh, massive deepfake uh, pornographic images. It was just a simple chatbot on Telegram that targeted 100,000 people. Um, and this one happened just a few years ago in Spain, um, and children were targeted um, with deepfakes by their own peers. Now, a very common question that I hear a lot, um, what is the difference? Why should we be so scared and pay separate attention to deepfakes? We have had Photoshop, we have had misinformation, disinformation for centuries, um, and that is really the case. So I have a nice example from the 20th century, beautiful picture. Um, so most of you, I would assume, would recognize the people in the middle, uh, and also by the beautiful that was sarcastic. Uh, so that's uh, Stalin and Lenin. And this picture gradually turned into this. Uh, you can most likely assume the reasons for it, because lots of the pe people from the first picture were um, killed. Uh, then it turned into this, and it eventually turned into this uh, picture of Stalin. So, of course, Photoshop was used everywhere. Uh, but the thing with uh, the difference that we have um, is these four important points. So it's the volume, the velocity, sophistication, and no skills required. Now, the first two, I don't want to waste the time on it. I think it's pretty clear what they mean but sophistication and no skills required. Now, when we're talking about Photoshop, what often happens is that uh, you need someone who is skilled. Uh, to be skilled, you spend enormous amount of time to actually develop those skills, to be able to create Photoshopped images, and not even talking about videos, that will be that sophisticated. 
Uh, the other thing is that usually with regular Photoshop, you can also have pretty good detection tools. So the detection will say that this is actually a Photoshop image. Uh, but now uh, what happens, so for example, the Telegram one that I showed, uh, to generate the deepfake image, you had to upload an image of a person that you want to create a deepfake, and within less than a minute, within basically a few seconds, it generates a deepfake image out of it. So you don't need any skills, uh, you don't need to even spend um, lots of money on it, because it's also very affordable. In fact, there are programs where you can go and do it for free. Uh, the other thing is uh, the sophistication, and this is this changes the way that the information space, because we're used to disinformation, misinformation, but the sophistication of deepfakes, I think, changes the way that we should perceive the information space. And um, I was skeptical if I should include a video, but uh, just to illustrate it to you, I would like to show two short videos. Also, bear in mind that these videos are almost four years old now, three, four years old. Um, so, yeah, I hope it will play. Oh, the audio is not... Um, is it possible to, because we tried and it was working, can we turn on the audio? Um, because it's on my laptop. It was working on my laptop, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. There. Sorry about that. Then let's do it with, without the um, audio part. Uh, but you can see, so this was basically created, this is in the Dallas Museum. Uh, this is what we call now a uh, digital twin. Um, of course, there are lots of legal issues because imagine one day having a digital twin of yourself without giving permission to it. Uh, but um, this basically, they used all the recordings that they had uh, to kind of train the system uh, to create this deepfake on DALI. And this one is also very uh, famous if you are uh, encountering, if you are researching on deepfakes. Uh, but I still find it to be one of the best ones. Uh, again, this video is about, I think, three years old, so you can see the quality. This is not Tom Cruise, in case if you thought that this is Tom Cruise. Uh, this is not him. Um, and closer to the end, you will see, actually, he comes closer, and um, maybe I can... Yeah, so he will remove. And they did fake the audio as well. So it's also, when, when he speaks, it sounds like Tom Cruise. This video was actually very interesting because lots of people genuinely thought that this was Tom Cruise. Um, so just to see it from a closer look, so you can see, so that's uh, the person behind actually this deepfake, um, and uh, this is the image, this is the deepfake Tom Cruise, um, about three years old. So the other element of my research is on personalized truth, and this is something um, you have probably heard of what post-truth era is, it was um, um, by the Oxford, the Oxford Dictionary, um, uh, said it was the word of the year in 2016. But I think we need to understand one um, thing about how the information space has changed. It's not just that we uh, disregard the objective facts, but it's that the reality and the information is extremely tailored to us. And this is not in itself a new thing that I'm saying. There are lots of academics that have already told, talked about the issues of these personalized fits that we are having uh, but uh, the thing is that I believe that we need to talk from the perspective of personalized truth because if we think about decades ago, uh, even if we had uh, opposition media or different types of sources, at the end it was mostly the journalists that could also be liable or accountable for what they were spreading and we would kind of could track it down to the original source. Now here it will be very difficult to understand how that system of belief for an individual was developed because we basically don't know what's happening with an individual where they are using three, four, five platforms. And um, I think Cambridge Analytica as well uh, was also part of it that illustrated it perfectly. Now, coming to uh, the third part, and that's how it's going to actually threaten um, academia. So I also want to say, so this is not misinformation in general. I'm talking in particular about deep fakes, so that's from my own angle. Um, and I think there are two major threats that uh, we will encounter soon. So one is uh, how pretending to be an academic information, and I will illustrate it on the next slide, uh, it will help with deep fake videos to generate, for example, um, create a deep fake video of any of the professors saying that, for example, 
you know what, no, actually, COVID didn't exist, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can imagine uh, what's going to happen. And not just that, uh, but I will come back to it in my next slide. The second threat is actually how it's going to undermine the academic research itself. Because, so I've been a PhD for a few years and I've been uh, working with academics. And of course, when we are conducting research, our research can have some vulnerable places. We also collect data. Sometimes we trust the data that we collect. Um, and uh, the question is how aware are academics themselves about this possible data? And I will show which type of data I'm talking about. So this one is actually very interesting. It was just a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, by AI, so it's, it uses different, so it generates the text as well. Uh, but um, so what the BBC uh, investigation found is that there are some YouTube platforms. Some of those videos have several tens of millions of views that are targeting mostly kids and they are very pseudoscientific. So they are generating, uh, I mean, we can basically talk eventually generating images when we can say that the earth is flat, uh, where we can say that uh, the moon landing didn't happen. And also we should understand that children are the most susceptible group. Um, and uh, we know that, for example, for far right as well, they usually target children or teenagers because it's easier to indoctrinate them and to radicalize them. Uh, so I didn't actually want to include the link to that uh, image here, but if you are interested in uh, misinformation in academia, this is one of the articles that I would have actually firmly recommended to go through it, and you can find the YouTube channel as well. Um, the other one is actually, um, this is when it comes to deepfakes for academics. So as you can see, uh, lots of uh, images such as MRI data can be deepfaked, so you can remove cancer from the MRI images, you can edit, that data can be hacked and you might not even be able to recognize it. Uh, uh, you can deepfake satellite images, which also happens. And then we know that we are out there trying to conduct investigation or research. Sometimes we might do that research based on uh, the images that we collect, depending on the type of research it, that you do. Um, so this is also the question is, um, are academics actually aware about this? Um, um, and what are the measures to actually kind of try to prevent this type of misinformation coming part of academic research. And the consequences of this will be actually, if it comes out, for example, a research comes out, and somehow you get discovered that there was some data used that was actually deepfake, the level that it will keep, make um, un undermine trust in academia because, for example, one of the very interesting things about deepfakes is something that's called the liar's dividend. So it's basically even if you have good detection tools, people are already aware that that technology exists there. And also several experts have said that within a few years, maybe even now, there will be deepfakes that we won't be able to actually detect if it's a deepfake or not. Mm -hmm. So that basically means someone who is a malicious actor can come and say, you know, your, deepfake, your detection tools are just not good. This is not a genuine video, or the other way around. This is a genuine video. So um, that type of undermining our um, belief in information is actually very dangerous. And I, I thought this, this might be interesting. I recently came across uh, this article. So uh, this was 2023, uh, this summer, I think, August. So this was the first time that I actually saw an um, academic research that is targeting, in particular, deepfakes and scientific knowledge uh, dissemination. Um, and yes, I mean, if we're talking about uh, uh, reality and uh, believing in information, the era that we are entering, this distrust in what we see with deepfakes are going to increase. It's not going to be on the same level as it used to be. Uh, and it is important to try to take care, especially of our children. So we have no idea what's happening at the schools. So imagine if uh, your child uh, encounters uh, uh, misinformation or disinformation online, comes to a parent asking whether that scientific information is true or not. Uh, lots of parents, I do understand that, I would have assumed that probably lots of you will have some kind of STEM background. So I'm coming from humanities, uh, I'm a lawyer, and I would have said that lots of parents might actually struggle to give the right answer to the child. 
and we can never understand how long it takes for the child. The child might be on those accounts, for example, for years. Um, now, when it comes to uh, how to uh, target deepfakes, this is a very difficult one. And um, one of the difficulties for my research is that this requires interdisciplinary research and nothing else. So as a lawyer, for example, if I came and said, you know, we can uh, target malicious use of deepfakes, we just need regulation that would have been a lie because that's not going to work that way. Regulation will never be enough. And my argument is that even if one of these four elements is missing, we will not be able to actually target deep things on the ground. So detection technology, detection technology it's always going to be weak. It will always uh, say that uh, there is this liar's dividend. When we're talking about hashing, that basically means being able, using, for example, blockchain technology to kind of be able to authenticate where the video or the recording is uh, originating from that also has its own weaknesses. Regulation, uh, some of you I think have been working with AI and law and you can see how long it takes for lawyers and regulation uh, to kind of try to catch up with the technological advancements. So that might take some time. Uh, and the fourth one is um, just acceptance of this new reality and awareness. And I think this is by the way where the role of academia comes in and universities such as Cambridge or King's College, uh, they are going to play a crucial role in a way that we actually make people aware about what is happening online, how to actually manage to tackle misinformation. Um, and if you ask me, I would have said that for the universities, because I know that this is my understanding, that was kind of the target of this conference to understand what the universities can do. Mm -hmm. I understand that by academia, we usually are probably targeting just the universities or after, after that. But I think we need to target education itself. So we need to include raising the same awareness in schools, uh, making sure that children, because children now are extremely in a vulnerable position, there is no protection. And I hear a lot from, uh, I have lots of uh, friends who are doing, um, who are working with um, uh, climate and environmental crisis. And I hear them often saying that the older generation kind of failed us because they could have prevented what we are facing now. And I hope that with this information thing, we will also not kind of fail this upcoming generation because we never know what type of ind indoctrination and radicalization will soon start happening. The results of it, we might start witnessing in like five or 10 years. I have nephews, and this is by the way, the end of the, uh, presentation, but just the, uh, I have nephews that are five, six years old, and uh, I can say that both they are teachers and they themselves often use YouTube to uh, learn uh, information. So that's why um, I think um, this, I think, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we'll be happy to answer the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we are still running a bit behind, but we've probably got five minutes for questions, so just a few quick ones. So I see one at the back there. Then we'll come to you. Um, how do you propose to deal with the ambiguity between uh, reality and fiction, which lots of children sort of directly encounter through virtual environments? Mm -hmm. So that is the total curation of social <coughs> much information or context of someone playing a video game. So, yeah. Um, so how do you deal with that? That is actually uh, fantastic questions, and I uh, raise it in my thesis as well. But the issue is, and this is why I'm very pro-interdisciplinary research, because I am here as a lawyer trying to kind of raise the issues from the legal perspective. But I also feel very lonely in the field, because the universities also do not provide that type of collaboration opportunities, for example. Because the question that you are raising, I would have assumed that it's more psychology-related as well. So it's not something that necessarily a lawyer would have been uh, able to answer. So uh, I can say that I raised the same question in my thesis, and I say that it is of utmost importance that we actually do an in-depth research into how this, because the metaverse is also going to be uh, a big issue for deepfakes. So one, by the way, when it comes to personalized truth, the other thing that's being predicted in the world of metaverse is that Deepfakes will be used there for advertisement as well. So, for example, you are in this metaverse universe, and based on the data that is collected on you, you 
won't even know. So for example, knowing that you lost someone recently that you love, uh, somehow the data based on, uh, depending also what type of data you gave, it might be able to generate uh, um, a couple sitting there talking about something. You don't know that they are trying to advertise you something. They also to, might be able to use that uh, voice that will be similar to your relative or to the, to the person that you care, mm -hmm. etc. So it's kind of like a very, and we are going to leave children there completely alone. Um, um, so, yes. Uh, the question yes. Uh, yeah, you mentioned earlier when you talked about the creation of deep fakes could now be performed by someone with little or no um, expertise. But this is only possible because there's been a software developer with the necessary expertise who's created something accessible. So, if someone created a deep fake and there was some harm that arose from the creation of that deep fake, who should the law hold accountable? Well, that is a very good question, and unfortunately, the answer is that is the issue because there is nothing, and it stays uh, out without kind of. So you can take down. So if, for example, the platform like the Telegram um, uh, chatbot that I mentioned, so straight away that chatbot was taken down because it was also generating illegal uh, content, uh, child pornography is not protected by any type of free speech. So you straight away uh, take it down and you can keep someone liable for it. But what about if you are creating an account, um, you are generating more like a satire type of uh, deepfakes. Now, in this case, you will have uh, First Amendment, for example, in the US or free speech in lots of cases in lots of countries protecting it. But the issue is you might, for example, create that deepfake as a satire, but then someone takes it from your account and then spreads it online. Now, is the creator in fault of this? Most likely no, because I think nobody wants to get rid of satire when it comes to uh, political content. Uh, but then the other thing is becomes also difficult where it originates from. So how can we find who actually started spreading? Because also it will be extremely unjust if we start holding accountable or liable people who basically come across the information and they are like, oh wow, what if this is true? Let me share it. So you, can't, you need to find the original source, and that becomes incredibly difficult because often with that type of radical information, the original source will be somewhere in the dark web, which is also very problematic yeah. to figure out where it comes from. Thank you. I, I think, unfortunately, I'm sure...